So this is very enjoyable to be able to tell stories. Um, and I was thinking about like what particular story I would tell, and I thought about the theme of the conference, <clears throat> that being that of time. And one story came to mind that it completely turns time upside down, the idea and concept of time. So uh, I'll tell you, and it also connects to Pakistan, and there have been lots of uh, requests from stories from Pakistan for some reason. So uh, I'd like to tell a story about that. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And this is a story uh, that is from around 1980, uh, 1981 or 82. So I want to give you some context of this. Um, in Texas, in the United States, we had, Sheikh Fadlullah had uh, built, with the help of so many others, uh, a medrasa in the middle of like the hill country of Texas. And uh, it was really an extraordinary place in that it was one of the, it was probably the first of, I think it was the first of its kind, where it was a madrasa community where we had, we of course we had the mosque, but we had la, cells of living quarters where people could come, some married couples as, and some children, and then individuals who can come regardless of, invited, regardless of uh, medhab or background, to come and experience a, a course on Islam uh, from the different perspectives of the teachers that we invited from all over the world, but in an atmosphere that underscored the spiritual nature of Islam. So as part of the course of the practices, there was regular nightly the gatherings of dhikr, and some people went on retreat, and we had uh, Sheikh Vallala was there, and many different shayukh came and visited us. At one point, there, we developed a, uh, a trust called the Zahra Trust, and that was a trust that would uh, hopefully be in benefit of other people, and one of the focuses of that trust was Pakistan. And that came about because we had somebody amongst us who was from Pakistan and felt that with the talents that we had in the community that we could do something there that would be beneficial to the people who went and the people who uh, were there in, the, in Pakistan. So there was an initial group that was selected, and I happened to be in that initial group, and we moved to a small village in Pakistan, just outside of a place called Bahawalpur, in a village called Ahmedpur Sharkia. And it was mainly a very agric uh, uh, agricultural vil village, uh, not much infrastructure, and uh, people who were living there were mainly involved in cotton, the cotton industry, and also growing uh, cauliflower and uh, cauliflower and more cauliflower. <laughs> that's, and I know I can say that because that's pretty much our diet was cauliflower while we were there. Uh, There's no supermarkets or imported foods or anything like that at all. So we built, a, we, we actually rented a, a place to have a zawiya, a center for us to have dhikr, and uh, we purchased some land in which we were then going to build a women's clinic to serve the women of the community who were really in need of uh, uh, medical attention, particularly on the, on the gynecological side. Uh, there was a lot of uh, kind of half-baked doctors and, and uh, some people practicing local medicine who really didn't know what they were doing. So there's a lot of sort of barbaric things that were going on regarding uh, women. And... Uh, so we opened up this, uh, we built the center, uh, we built the, the clinic. And so while I was there, we heard about this sheikh that was coming. And his name was uh, Sheikh Sayyid Ikram Hussein. 
and he was a chisti uh, sheikh, and we got to know him really, really well. Just to give you an idea, a flavor of the type of being that he was, the first day that we were invited to meet him, we came to a uh, a place that was like his Hanukkah, a, a, a building in which there was a, a private residence for himself and the rest of it was an open area, had a covered area. And he was having a medjlis. And in Pakistan, in that tradition, there was kawali being sung and there were people uh, who were into, uh, God intoxicated, just throwing themselves up in the air and you know, it was a wild scene, um, and people throwing money. There were people with stacks of money this high and just throwing money at the sheikh. And the, and the sheikh, of course, I, I, I'll tell you maybe another story, but all that money that I saw kind of falling all over the place was all being shuffled to the back in which there was two of the sheikh's students who were then giving out to a line of the poor who were back there and, and he made sure that not one rupee was left at the end of the day, that all of it was given away to the poor. So it wasn't really for him at all. And so when he saw us coming, he stopped the whole process. He, he just said, stop, stop, and we all, they all stopped. And he went into his room and he asked that we all be brought into the room. And we got into the room and we sat in a, in a circle around him, and he was, you know, dressed as a as a chisti sheikh. They they have a certain caps that chisti sheikhs wear. It's called the chisti cap. I mean, that's what the chisti topi. And he was, you know, wearing very simple clothes. And when he came into that room and he he had it, we were sitting there. He took off his hat and he leaned on a pillow next to him, and stretched his feet out. Right. Now, I know that doesn't sound very odd, but to all of his, his students who were outside, who were peeking through the window, right, seeing why the, the sheikh had left and why is he sitting there now without his hat, with his feet stretched out, well, of course, we poisoned him, right? So, that, so the, the, the uproar went through the whole of his community that we, are, we poisoned the sheikh because he wouldn't be sitting like that with people. He, he would be sitting in a more sort of dignified way in a, as he would with the uh, other folks that were there. So they literally pushed the door open, made a big uh, ruckus. They, they grabbed one of my uh, friends who was in the circle, and they started questioning what's going on here. And, all. and the chef, of course, said, get out. He chased them all out. You know, he said, what are you doing? And they said, but look, you are laying here, sitting there with your feet stretched, your hat, hat is off. What have they done to you? He said, go away. I'm sitting with my family. So he says, I'm, and he's relaxed. So he sent everybody out, and we were all sitting there. Then he went around the room. We were sitting in a circle, and he, and he asked us about Sufism. He asked us about our practices. And he then went around the room and said, what's the... Uh, uh, what have you learned from being a Sufi, right? So there was about 16 of us. So he went around the room and everybody, all these Americans, you know, a few British, they didn't speak too much. But all these Americans were right there ready to say, oh, I benefited a great deal from my Sufi experience and about the nafs. And, and he was sitting there bored to death listening to. And he went around the room and asked everybody, he said, what did you... Cain, what did, everybody had an answer. Then he finally got to, there was a young man who was my, uh, I, I was his guardian. He was at that time about 16 years old. I was looking after him. And he went to him and he said, what have you gotten out of Sufism? And he says, I have no idea. I don't know anything about Sufism. And then the sheikh looked at us all and he said, he's the only Sufi in the room. But kind of coming up. So just, you know, this is a, you know, a though, a taste of this incredible being, you know. And so we developed over time a very friendly, a very uh, fatherly, in a way, relationship with him. Um, he, when I was living in, uh, I moved actually from this town to Karachi, 
And here's where the story I am what I'm intending to tell you. We moved to Karachi, and he, I was there at that time with uh, my uh, my wife, who, mashallah, she's passed away. Rahmatullah. Um, we were there, and she, uh, Sheikh Kram, was visiting us every month, for about ten days out of every month, and I was there that time for about a year, and we were really enjoying his company and so on. Anyway, my my wife uh, she became ill, and she had a something wrong. She was having a uh, a, ble a, a bleeding issue that wouldn't stop. So Sheikh Ikram came and he saw what was going on with her, and he says to me, "You must immediately go to the bazaar." And you need to get two things for us, for her. One is eight grams of afyun. You know afyun? Opium, right? And eight grams of berberis, which is a, a, another a herb, a, a bark, I think, from a berberis tree. And you need to bring it, take it and then grind it together in a mortar and pistle and make tablets out of it, dry it with tablets, the size of a garbanzo bean, you know, a chickpea. And I said, well, you know, Sheikh Ikram, I mean, this is not a very good, playing out good for me. I mean, if I go to the bazaar as an American and I'm looking for opium, that's, that's not a very good, for, uh, the outcome is going to come out of this, because I was projecting all this, you know, what I was afraid to do. And he said, no. He said, you go immediately now. Go to the bazaar and you do this. I'm going. He said, you had to leave. But when you come back with it, you will make these pills. So I really uh, was reticent to do it, but I trusted him. And I, I've always, always trusted him. And I, I knew things happen around him which are inexplainable. So I went to the bazaar. Now, in Karachi... There's a mosque called uh, called Karada, or an area called Karada. You know it, okay. And in that, it's a mosque that's surrounded with shops all the way around. And in the back of that mosque is a bazaar. And I'm saying this, giving you a note for effect, it was a bazaar bazaar. Let me have to tell you. Yeah, I don't know if you've been to it before, but uh, there are very questionable things you can buy back there. And, you know, it's in, it's in the dark area of the shadow of this mosque. So, but ha there also happened to be dawakhanas there, places where you can buy medicine. So I started looking around for, the first thing was on my mind was to get the opium out of the way. And I was looking around for police, of course, because I could easily have gotten arrested. So I went to... Uh, the first Dawakhana and explain to them what I'm looking for. And they immediately became very angry with me. And literally they took us, they brought a broom handle and they chased me out of the store with a broom handle. I said, okay, moth, moth, I'm getting out of here. So I, I left. Then I went to another one. And th I mean, I got that kind of in, uh, welcome from all the Dawakhanas because they didn't want to get in trouble. So I was at a loss. I, I was able finally from, uh, to get with the program, and before I'd ask for the opium, I asked for the Berberis, and I did get that, but I still didn't have the opium. And then it was time for coming for Maghrib, and I'd been there for hours, uh, having left that day on Sheikh Ikram's advice. So I went, uh, I started heading out of the bazaar thinking, well, I just can't do this, can't get this... Uh, for her. So I'm just about to leave and you know at around six or seven o'clock in the evening around Karada, it's very tumultuous. There's there's ca uh, vans and tongas and horse-drawn carriages and all I mean it's very tumultuous. So I was in the middle of this tumult and all of a sudden I feel somebody pulling at my sleeve. And I was already having a habitual Response, because you in Pakistan you're constant. Somebody's pulling your sleeve for something, and they they're asking for uh, money. So they were going. I think it was uh, what did they say? Uh, bak, not bakshish. Uh, yeah, bakshish. Yeah, they were saying bakshish. 
And I looked down and, and I didn't really see the person at, at first look. And I just said, no, 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 Mothnav, I'm not. And then I looked at him and there was this beautiful old man, beautiful white beard with a chisti cap, sitting there on a white blanket in the middle of a dirt and dust. And I mean, everything was around us. And there was this, just the center of the eye of a tornado or a hurricane. Just total peace, total stillness. There he was. And he said, brother, sit down. So I immediately felt, you know, when things like that happen, you sense all of a sudden there's something going on beyond you. Something special is happening. So I sat down with him and he said to me, uh, why are you here? And I started to explain to him, and a tear came to his eye. And I said, uh, well, what about you? Why are you here? And he said, now here's the thing about time. He says to me that last night, that was the night before Sheikh Ikram instructed me, because I'm in that day, to go to the bazaar. He said, last night, my chisti sheikh came to me in a dream and instructed me to come to this place and sit here and wait for an unusual happening. And he said, you're the unusual happening, right? So, and I just, you know, it was, it was a very beautiful moment. And he, and he said, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for eight grams of opium. <laughs> and he had a, he turned out that he was a Hakim, a Chisti Hakim, a Tibi Yunani. He had Tibi Nebuwi and Tibi Yunani. This is the medicine, the Greek medicine, and he's a practitioner of Greek medicine and the medicine of the Prophet Muhammad. So he pulled out, he had a black bag, and in Pakistan, they, like so many places in the East, he had a scale made out of brass, you know, the, the kind that you hold and it tips this way and that way with little tiny things to measure. And he held it out and he pulled out of his bag a plastic bag and I knew what opium looked like. And there he was, he pulled out a disc of opium and he put it on the scale and he put the, the, the gram things and it was exactly eight grams of opium, exactly. And he took it from the scale and he get, and he wrapped it up and he he gave it to me and of course being a stupid american i wanted to offer him 50 rupees for it right but no you know that's not what was going on you know uh he said no i don't want anything from you you know he said this is where my sheikh had ordered me to go and that and this is for you so we stood up together and i we hugged each other and I don't even, I don't remember, he never told me his name. I, I know I told him my name. But as the dark kind of came, it was becoming Maghrib, well into Maghrib, he, I got distracted by something and the next thing I saw was his back moving through the crowd and he just left me. But he, And I, I really looked, I looked at my hands to see if I actually had it, if it was, you know, if this wasn't some kind of like, you know, psycho, uh, moment that I was having there, but I had the uh, the eight grams of uh, opium in my hand, so I took the eight grams home and I was touched by that whole experience, and I made took a mortar and pestle and and ground up the berberus with the opium, with a little bit of lemon juice. I remember that's what he told me, and made little chickpeas, and then let it dry a little bit, and he said to give my wife. I can't remember the actual number, two or three or four, every three, four hours. So I gave it to her, and sure enough, within um, within about uh, eight hours or so, her bleeding stopped completely, and she was recovering from this incident. The only thing is she was high as a kite, you know? So, I mean, that, you know, so, which which I thought, in this case, it's probably okay, you know? So she was, and then the next day, 
Sheikh Ikram came and he saw her and he saw that she was high as a kite and he said, let me see the pills, you know. And I showed it to him and he looked at me, I'd never forget his face. He looked at me and said, too big, right? <laughs> you know, he was a pop, a pop. Because the chickpea in Pakistan is not the same as the chickpea in the America. I mean, the chickpeas in the States are like this, the Pakistani chickpeas are like, you can hardly, hardly see them, right? So he, he told me to cut each one of them into four. So I was giving her four times the dose that she had. But it worked. You know, I need to keep it. So, so that's uh, uh, one of my experiences with Sheikh Ikram in Pakistan. And there, there are several others that, that uh, if you were the fortunate ones to buy my book, that it's in the, that uh, book there. And there are many stories about Pakistan. I'd like to share um, one other one with you. Again, in a, quite an extraordinary story. Uh, I was living at this time in Islamabad for about three, four months in uh, near Mah Mahala Road in F7. I don't know if people may know where that is. Yeah. And uh, there, in that time, around 1981, 82, there was a thing called the Juma Market in which the Afghans used to come, uh, refugees used to come and bring the rugs and other things there to, uh, to sell to people and send money back across the border. So there was all kinds of things, jewelry, rugs, shawls, you name it, even food people were selling there. So I used to go there uh, every week while I was living in, in uh, Islamabad. It was so wonderful. So one day when I'm there, I'm with a friend of mine. His name was Abdullah, Abdullah Nuri. We, this man approaches us, just comes running out of the crowd. It's quite crowded. And he says, um, are you the, the, the Sufis from America? And usually I don't like to answer questions like that. You know, but... You know, I just looked at him, and he was so, he had a beautiful, innocent face. I said, yeah, I guess we're those Sufis from America. He says, come with me. You know, it's like some movie. You know, he just says, come with me right away, you know. You know, so he literally grabs my hand, and he, he walks me through the crowd, and we get, and there's a car waiting for us, engine going, driver in the car. He says, get in the car. And I said, okay. So we got in the car. And he took off, right? And, and we were sitting in the back seat. It was quite a large, large Mercedes. And we're driving through Islamabad. And then we get maybe 10 or 15 minutes. He was telling us, you're going to meet the sheikh. The, the, we knew you were here, and you need to meet the sheikh. And I, I said, okay, we'll meet him. So we get to this house in Islamabad, and the driveway... And outside the house was a long line of women with babies. And a lot of them appeared to be ill. So it looked like a line of people waiting to come in for the blessing of the sheikh. So we were taken right to the front. I mean, I, it just happened all like that. And we were taken inside of a room. And in that room, there was a char pie in the middle of the room. A charpai, if you don't know what it is, it's like a bed with four posts and a frame that's woven in between with leather uh, so that it makes kind of a, a bed and then a mattress is, or a, 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 a quilt is laying on top of it. And so in the middle of this room was a charpai and in the middle of the charpai was uh, like literally kind of a bump and over the bump there was a blanket. And there were already about six or seven people sitting in the room quietly. And they asked me to sit down. So I sat down. And the guy who brought us in there said, just sit, the sheikh will come. And it was a very odd. I mean, we're all sitting there in this room with a charpai and a lump on the charpai. And there was very little in the room except for one huge uh, Arabic calligraphy, which had a giant stamp on it. And I'll tell you about that in, in a minute. And we waited and waited. Tea was served. 40 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour passed. Nothing. We're all, I mean, everybody else seemed to be quite content sitting there. 
And I was a little uh, agitated. Uh, I didn't know what was going to happen, and I had other engagements that evening, so I felt, eh. Then, all of a sudden, the, this lump on the bed started to move a bit, and I, I was shocked, because it, it, cause how, I mean, it's either it's a cat or a dog or a monkey or a small child. I couldn't figure out what was happening under this lump. And all of a sudden, this beautiful hand came out and pulled the, the, the blanket away. And there was this small human being. He couldn't have been more than four feet, five inches, four feet, six inches. He, he emerged from it, this beautiful being with a found his hat and stumbled around looking for his glasses. His glasses literally were probably about a half an inch thick. And he, he got up, and, he, and the man who, was, who had brought me there said, this is the sheikh. And it turned out that his name was Sheikh Mabud, uh, Jil al Jilani, and that they told me that he was 158 years old, and that I was blessed to be in this room to meet him. So we all were kind of awestruck by this incredible being. I'd never seen a human being look like this before. His hands and arms, I could see part of his arm, looked like parchment paper. You could hard, you could see the, some of the veins in his hand almost through. You could see the bone almost. Face was very thin, you know. And it was hard for me to conceive of somebody being 158 years old. But I was soon to be, my uh, reticence to accept that was soon relieved by what I heard after that. So he saw us, and he called me up to the, uh, he said, Dad, he spoke Arabic, by the way. And he called me up to his bed, and he grabbed my face. And it was quite amazing. His face felt, his hand felt like a little vice on my chin. He really grabbed it hard. And he looked at me, and he said, Ente Irani. And I said, that, an Amriki. And he said, ah, and he said, Amriki. And then he said to me something which just, blew my mind. He said, you are the student of Sheikh Fadlullah Hayri, whose father was Ahmed Hayri. And then he starts telling me stories about Sheikh Fadlullah's father. Here, here, how is it possible? You know? And he starts telling me that, that where Sheikh uh, Ahmed was Sheikh Fadlullah's father, where he was in 1823, and all these things, and I'm just listening to this narrative, and I'm, 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 bro I'm at one point broke into tears because I believed him in every way, and I, and I was awestruck by the, how is it that I, here I am in Pakistan, get dragged from a, a bazaar, a Juma market across town, and here I am meeting this man who knows my sheikh, Sheikh Fadlullah, and knows his father. And only saw me for the for, for a few seconds. So we had that one meeting with him, and he asked me to come back every day, right? And he also asked me to bring him uh, five gifts every day, right? Oh, sorry, let me. I want to edit that a bit. I called Sheikh Fadlullah that night and told him the, how I met this sheikh. And he said, I have to check with my mother. At that time, his mother was still alive. So he checked with his mother about the dates that she would know that where her husband had visited in India and other places. And she, I spoke to him the next day, and he confirmed that those were the dates that his father was in India at the Jamia Masjid in Delhi around 1823. And that they, he didn't, she didn't know anything about this sheikh. Uh, sorry, that 19. Was it 1923? I'm losing, no, it was 18. It was 18 something. Yeah, it wasn't 19. Because he was 158 years old. So it was an 18 something. It could have been 1860. I, lo I lose track of what the number was. But it was a long time ago. And so... I confirmed that with, with Sheikh Fadullah. And then Sheikh Fadullah said to me, bring him, every day bring him five gifts. Now imagine, what do you bring a 158-year-old person 
as a gift. So it was a lesson for me. I, every, so every day before I would go meet him, I would go to the bazaar and just buy him five little things. Like sometimes I'd buy him a panjatan brexlet, you know, or some plastic tasbi, or just five random things from the bazaar. And I would bring it to him. And every time I brought it to him, he took each single thing and he looked at it as though it was the most amazing thing he'd ever seen. He scrutinized every single thing. And every time he looked, when I brought him just like a plastic something that had the name of Allah or something that spun around, you know, you get these funny things in Pakistan, you know, and he looked at me and he said, SubhanAllah, you know, he just, you know, to him it was a marvel. And so this went on and every day he started then saving part of his dinner for me. And so when I would give him the five gifts, he would save me five teaspoons or spoons of his food left. And he would feed me like a little baby. You know, he, he took, he laughed at me every time. He just opened your mouth and put it in my mouth. And it was just sort of a very sweet, uh, you know, transaction with him. So I'll tell you a little bit more. So Sheikh Fadlallah then says to me, uh, you must get his life story. Now, could you imagine what that would be like to get a man's story that's 158 years old? So I, I went to him that night, or the night after I had received this instruction, and I asked him, I said, Sheikh, I, Sheikh Fadal has asked me to ask you to, we want to take your life story, we want to write a book about you. And he just smiled at me, he said, it's too late. And I, and I said, well, why? Is somebody else taking it? And he smiled at me and he pointed at his shoulders that the recording angels have already taken it. So he didn't want me to, to pursue it. And I asked him over a couple of nights if I could take his life story. He still refused. And one time I got a little clever and I got a, a little uh, Olympus uh, tape recorder you know, with the small tapes and I hid it in my, my kurta, right? And I was wired myself up to my sleeve so that he couldn't see it or hear it, right? And I said, and I held my hand out, kind of, uh, uh, kind of trying not to be obvious. And then I asked him, I said, can you just tell us, you know, something about your life? He wouldn't talk to me, right? He literally would not speak to me. And I knew something was up because I knew he knew something was up. And I asked him, I said, Sheikh, um, is everything all right? He says, he told somebody to translate, he said, turn it off, right? He somehow knew that I had this recording. So I, I, I turned it off. And so I didn't get anything from him, except I found out uh, on one of my visits there, when I was sitting in a circle around him, I would spend a lot of days with him. Because he would sometimes just, but the, his presence and his baraka and the people that were there were just an amazing group of people. One day, uh, some two older men came to the door. Uh, older, I mean, now it's a very relative thing to say, isn't it? That two older men came to the door and the sheikh said, they saw them fumbling with the, the screen latch and they said, let the old men in, right? And they came in and they sat on either side of me and I said, this is a, this is a tariqa of old men, you know, I just, so I, I turned to one of him and I said, how old are you? And he said, I'm 100, right? And my brother there, he's, he's 98. I said, well, how do you know the sheikh? I said, oh, he's my father. And I said, wow. I, I'm telling you, this is what, uh, what it was. And I asked him, I said, well, I'm really trying to get some story about him. And he said, well, we'll tell you something, but we know somebody who may tell you. So he said, there's a wing commander in Peshawar who's the commander of the base. And he says, you should go there and see him and ask him to tell you about Sheikh, Ikra uh, Sheikh Mahbud. So within two days, I was off to Peshawar and I get to the, to the air base and I, I got permission to get in. I can't remember how I did it, but got onto the air base and asked to see the, the wing commander. And I get to the office of the wing commander 
and it was just an ordinary Pakistani military office with a male secretary and the wing commander. I finally, about 30 minutes in, got to see him and sat down, and he looked like an ordinary Pakistani uh, wing commander. You know, he had, you know, kind of had a zeal huck mustache and hair slicked back, and but there was something odd about him. I noticed that he had like red strings tied around his neck. I knew something here was kind of not this not ordinary. So I asked him about uh, Sheikh Maboud. I said, can you tell me something about Sheikh Maboud? And he said, I'll see if I can tell you anything. He says, give me a few minutes. I said, okay. So he left the room. And when he left the room, he was gone for a long time. The secretary had come and brought me tea once, twice. Time was going, and there was no wing commander. And I was thinking again, like, what's going on? Why is he not here? So after maybe an hour and a half, maybe two hours, I'm just sitting there thinking maybe I should just go. And then all of a sudden, I feel the, the floor under me shiver, like shake. And I thought it was an earthquake at first. And then again, you know, and then I got a little nervous, you know, and the secretary, you know, came in the room and looked at me like, like, uh-oh, right, you know, and he closed the door. He left me in there. And, he said, I and, I, and then the room started shaking a bit more, and then I hear these clanging sounds, clang, clang, metal clanging against the, you know, chains, I hear chains rattling, and then you know, all of a sudden the door busts open, and there's the wing commander, near, nearly stark naked, wearing a, an array of metal donuts all over his neck, his arms, his feet, connected by chains with a big metal cap with a spike and a metal uh, uh, spear, uh, you know, and, a, and a, 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 a bowl, a begging bowl, a metal begging bowl. And he started, you know, with all kinds of strings of color and, and he started dancing around the room saying all these enchant chants of saying Allah, Allah, and he would just go and go and just danced around me for like 15, 20 minutes. And I'm frozen uh, in awe of what's going on. I, I, I just don't know what's happening here. And he's just going into like almost like a, a, a state, a frenzy. And, and he went on and on. And finally, he just collapsed onto the floor in front of me. And, uh, and then he, and I said, <laughs> Are you going to tell me any stories <laughs> about Sheikh Maboud? And and he says to me, I contacted my 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 sheikh. Now I learned later that his sheikh has been dead for about seventy years, but he went into some in sort of trance and became in connection in some way. Get received this answer, and he looked at me and said, "There is no way." That I can, that I'm worthy enough, he said to me, to tell you anything about a man who has touched the 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 uh, the ground of uh, of Medina and Mecca over 100 times. And it, I said, what? 100 times? He and he was silent. He didn't answer me. And the secretary finally came in and said, you need to go now. And I left. Now later, I learned he belonged to a uh, some kind of a group. They're called the Malang, and they practice this uh, wearing metal to feel the the heaviness of the dunya, and it it's something that developed there in this part of the world that this they wear these things to experience that heaviness, and they do this practice in order so that they can feel free from it inwardly and not be uh, sense anymore the outer weight of all the, the life that they live. So this is essentially their, the practice. So I, I went back to Islamabad and I said, that man told me that Sheikh Maboud had performed uh, Hajj a hundred times, or rather a hundred and ten times, which I learned later. And they said, yes, he, he, he performed Hajj 110 times. He said that when he was a young man and he was in uh, Arabia, 
he was fighting against the Wahhabi group who were determined to destroy all the uh, uh, the tombs of Ahl Bayt and all the tombs of the Sufis and the Awliya. If you've ever seen pictures of uh, Janet al-Bakhi and before the uh, the Wahhabis came and destroyed everything, there were beautiful tombs and places to sit and marble structures and it was a place like almost like gardenic place, but the Wahhabis insisted to destroy everything, including the the wives the wives of the prophet's two graves, the grandson, uh, one of the grandsons of the prophet, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, just to destroy everything, and just to the ground, just leave a small brick as a as a mark, and so he fought against that Sheik Mahbud, and he. There was a warrant for his arrest. I'm telling you why, how he got to go to Hajj 110 times. He fought them, and there was a warrant out for his arrest. And that warrant was to bring him uh, to arrest him and bring him to Riyadh for execution, uh, or and also or to make tawbah and or you know to change his ways. And so he was he was finally captured, and he was brought to uh, uh, Riyadh where he was brought in front of Malik Abdulaziz, the king, uh, the first king of Saudi Arabia. And Ma uh, he asked him, he said, look, he says, we have an agreement with the Wahhabis. You can't fight us for this reason. You have to renege and not do this anymore. If you don't do it anymore, we'll spare your life. If you insist upon this, these behaviors, then you ha we have to execute you. So he, so he said, do you have anything to say? So Sheikh Mahbub recited a, a poem, and clearly Malik Abdulaziz was moved, and it, the, his eyes became tearful. It turned out that the, the poem was about love of the awliya, love of Ahl Bayt, and it was a poem that, sh that his mother used to read to the king before he went to sleep every night. So he just said, take, you know, they, I said, unwrap his head, bring him to me. He said, I don't ask you anything anymore. You'll have to then deal directly with the Wahhabis themselves. But for me, when you read this, he said, it touched my heart. And I'll give you, he says, you will be from this day forward a guest of the kingdom on Hajj every year until for the rest of your life. Of course, he didn't know what he was getting into there. <laughs> You know, and that was the calligraphy that was on the wall that I was telling you about earlier. He had a beautiful calligraphy, and and I looked at it when I this time closer, and it was signed by Malik Abdulaziz. It had his stamp on it, and in Arabic it said that Sheikh Mahbub Al Jalani, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will be as a guest of the kingdom for the rest of his life on Hajj. And he turned out that that he made Hajj a uh, hundred and ten times. An extraordinary uh, human being. I uh, left him uh, and went back to the States for a while. And when I came back, I came uh, to see him. And it was this time he, he was about 163, and he had passed away two weeks before I arrived in, uh, in Islamabad, so I couldn't see him. But I have a document that I did some research on him, and around 19... Uh, 90s, uh, sorry, no, 1980s. He, some of his uh, family brought him to Germany to do a special scan of his body because they, 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 he was not feeling entirely well because, you know, 158, 160. They brought him there and they did a scan of his body and they have a, a record of him that he had to be over, way over, a hundred years because of it, the, the body scan, they did a calcium scan of his body and they looked at his organs and it was indicative of a person way over 100 years old. They only had a few to compare it to, people that were 108, 109, 110, but this guy, this man was still kicking and alive and fret and they, at least uh, from that scan, we knew he was way, way over 100 uh, years old. So, Smila. So that's you know another uh, story from uh, from Pakistan. How are we doing on time? We have a minute. 
Thank you, Chuck. Another 25 minutes. Okay, I'll tell one more story. And then we end it there. Bismillah. This is going to be a little bit difficult to follow because um, it, I'm going to go back and forth in time a little bit. By the way, the reason I mentioned the first story about time is that he, the, the sheikh who had the vision of his sheikh the night before, right, and I was told to go to the bazaar the next day where he was to meet me, this is an interesting thing to ponder about time, the nature of time. This too has something to, uh, in a way, connected with time. So, I was in uh, there was a uh, in Manchester, I think, or in Leeds, in in England, there was a Sufi there. His name was Sufi Abdullah. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. I've heard of him before? Yes, he's contemporary. He died. No, no, no. He was a Pakistani. Um, beautiful, tall man that had a huge community of uh, people. They were all, uh, can't, I don't know what tariqa they belonged to. It doesn't really matter. But every year they had an urs, and Sufi Abdullah, you know, led the urs, and like literally thousands of people came from Birmingham, Leeds, and it was in a big field, and there was food. People were stirring in big pot, you know, there's big metal pots that they're like four feet high, five feet high, and they used to stir it with a with a a, a boat oar, you know. The, uh, I'm not kidding, with a boat oar. It's called a dake. It's amazing. It's a it is amazing. I, when I was in Lahore, at uh, Datasab, they have ones that you, they have a ladder. You have to climb up you, the pot to get to the top and pour food in. And then it's an amazing story in itself. Datasab in Lahore. They, they have, have continuously been feeding people for hundreds of years. And one person told me, and I don't know if it's true, but I think it probably is, is that they never have cleaned the pot. Ladies, don't get too disgusted. But, I mean, they never clean the pot. They just keep pouring in new stuff as people bring it, onions, meat, whatever, and they just keep stirring. They brought me something from that. I had it. It was very good. But anyway... Um, Coming back to Leeds, and Man I think it was Birmingham, rather, uh, there was this big horse, and Su uh, Sufi Abdullah was, was the, the grand master of the whole thing. And at one point, there was this we formed a giant circle uh, in the, in the, uh, around in a park on a beautiful field. And it was a huge circle, probably about 300 people, men and women, in, and everybody was doing dhikr, and it was an incredible moment. But I looked at, right across the circle from me, in front of me, I saw a beautiful young man with a beautiful velvet hat. I can tell it was velvet because it just looked that. And he's, he, was look, he was looking at his hands and then looking at me, and then looking at his hands. And I think, what, what's he doing? And I, I, you know, he's like looking at me very strange, like with beady eyes and and making this dua and then looking at me again. So I wanted to find out what this was all about. So I, afterwards I went to look for him. I couldn't find him anywhere. So I want you to keep that now in mind, that that's one event. Leave that for a moment. I'm living in Norwich now, in uh, Norwich, in, uh, England, with the Sheikh Abul Qadr's community at that time. We had a, quite a large uh, community there. And I went to live there and to be with them and to learn from Sheikh Abul Qadr and the others that are there. And I wound up really, because I spent a long time and I couldn't work, I wound up living in the mosque itself. And I lived in the back of the mosque where the coats would be hung up and shoes would come. And during the night it was cleared out, so I, that's where I slept. And my job was to live there was to take care of the the, the mosque, we sure it was clean, that the, the stingy areas were all clean and everything, and that was fine. But after a while, I realized that it wasn't, uh, I needed to move, I needed to make a change, and I was three months living in, the, in this mosque. My clothes were tattered, and I, I needed to get new clothes, and 
So I asked Allah every night, I said, please, Allah, open up for me that I can find a way back because I had nobody to, couldn't go to my family or anyone to get me a ticket. Or, so months went by and one Juma, I was uh, greeting everybody and all of a sudden this, this Egyptian man who I'd seen a lot of times always gave me a big hug and uh, it was really sweet. This time, when I was saying goodbye to me, I, he gave me a big hug. He reached into my pocket with his hand, and I felt that was very strange. So I, I had a, a reaction. I grabbed it, his hand, and he said, no, no. He said, don't look until I leave. And so he walked out of the mosque, and I reached in my pocket, and I looked, and there was a roll of 50-pound notes, about, about seven, 800 pounds, now, this is 1977. 750 pounds is a lot of money. And I'm going, whoosh, this is it. This is it. I'm, I'm gone, right? And I immediately went to the shop, got clothes. I didn't have any new clothes. I had, a, had my clothes were in tatters. Went to the train station. And I called up Sheikh Abu Qadr and I said, <laughs> uh, I'm leaving and please don't try to convince me to stay. I can't stay here anymore. I, I need to go. Just give me one advice, your last advice to me. And he said, very kindly, he just said, go to, to Sheikh Fadlala in San Antonio, Texas. Well, that's where I got my ticket, and I went to San Antonio, Texas. I'm there for a year or two. I'm, I'm fast-forwarding a little bit until one day one of my good friends there said, uh, let's go and make Umrah together. I said, okay, let's do it. So we went on Umrah, and we, well, rather, we went to Saudi Arabia. We landed in Jeddah, and we were going to take a, a, a bus from Jeddah to, uh, first, we're going to go visit the Prophet in Medina. So we went uh, on a bus to Medina. Now, while we're in the bus, this is now years later, right? While we're in the bus, this guy behind me keeps coming up to my neck and breathing down my neck, right? And I'm wondering, what is this? And I keep turning around, and then he moves back, and I go, okay. And, you know, I don't think he's strange, you know, in the way that you, would want, that you wouldn't think about it, but I let it go. And then a few minutes later, I, I feel him again on my neck, and I turn around, and this time he keeps his face, and he's looking at me, and there was something about those eyes. And he literally, because there was no place for him to move to the side because people were standing in the middle, he jumps over the seat, falls onto my lap, and he looks at me, puts his arms around me, crying, and he's hugging me and kissing me, right? And I just said, what, what is this? Who is this? I said, who are you? And I'm looking at, who are you? He said, it's me. I said, who's me? I did. He says, do you remember? He said, the Urs in Birmingham, right? The man who was sitting in front of you, making dua, that was me. I said, Allahu Akbar, that was you? He said, yes. He said, I will never forget your face, he said to me. And so I said, what brings you here? How, are you, how is this possible? He says, do you know what my dua was? I said, no, what was your dua? He said, my dua was that I asked Allah that one day I would be with you at the Rawdah of the Prophet And here we are, two, three years later, on a bus to Medina. He's there, and we're on our way to the Rawdah of the Prophet It was a joyful, incredible, awesome moment. We're on the bus, and we talked about it, and we cried. And, and I said, look, we don't have anywhere to stay. In Medina, he said, don't worry. He said, I have a good friend there. He'll look after us. So we get to Medina, and we get off the bus, and there's a Mercedes waiting for us. Big, beautiful Mercedes. So, well, now that's more like it, you know. And uh, we get off, and the door opens up to the Mercedes, and a guy comes out, and I'm just about to lose it right there. It's the Egyptian guy. Who gave me the money in the mosque? 
years before in the same, more or less the same time. And he looked at me and he said, Mustafa, I said, and he was our host in Medina. And so I was with him and with this man who prayed to be on our, to the, in the Raudab, the prophet with that, with me. And there we were together. Uh, how did these things happen? You could not plan any of this. You could not conceive of it. There are happenings that in you, and I know everybody here has had experiences that inform them of Allah's providence over everything. That no matter what you think you know, no matter what you think you believe, and what rational processes, yes, they all have their due. But there's another X factor, which is unexplainable, is that only where it says Allah brings the hearts together, that no one can bring the hearts, but Allah brings, and that's the truth. And it happens sometimes in a way that is unexplainable, inexplainable. And we had such a marvelous time together in, in Medina and then later in, the, in Mecca Mukarram. Anyway, these are some of the, the stories, inshallah, you'll find them also in the book. And, but I, I want to, the, the last thing I want to say about all of this is all of us have a story. And all of us, that story is an echo from the one and only story. Each one of us, life is a unveiling of the light and the intention of the reality of Allah Azawajal to be known and to be worshipped. So it doesn't matter if some stories are fantastic, some are bring in inspiration, some maybe appear ordinary, but to the person whose focus is the path of Allah, is to be awake and aware, to be connected to the light within them, then each thing that happens to you in your own story as it unveils as your life are stepping stones, windows, doors to your becoming more sensitive and resonant with a resonance with the light that's within you. So when you hear stories like this, your story may is as, is as wonderful as anybody else's story because it's your hope. Each, each of us unfolding and unpacking so that we can have that acknowledgement and realization of that everlasting light within us. So that's it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki Yawm Medin. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. Edna sarat al-mustaqeen. Sirat al-ladina anamta alayhim. Ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim wala al-dhalin. Subhana rabbika rabbi azati amaya sifun. Wassalam ala al-mursaleen. Alhamdulillah. Salaam alaykum.